Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. Once again, I'm going back to the archives. This time, I'm fixing the audio for one of the most incredible interviews we've had here on Gospel Tangents. It's with Dr. Mark Staker. He's written an amazing book, Hearken, O Ye People, the historical setting of Joseph Smith's Ohio Reve- Revelations. So, it's a fantastic book. This, uh, I think, was back in February or March of... Uh, 2017, one of the most surprising interviews, we talked about Black Pete, who's an early Mormon convert, but the things, the two things that Mark brought to my attention was he believes that Black Pete was the one who introduced speaking in tongues um, to the church. Uh, Also, that Black Pete may have uh, introduced polygamy to the church. So Mark's also got some interesting perspectives on the Fanny Alger incident and um, he's got definitely a very unique understanding of how the sealing power was restored uh, with the restoration of the Melchizedek priesthood depending on when you date that um, 1829 to 1831. So it's it's a very amazing conversation. We're going to get into the Kirtland banking crisis and uh, I I learned a lot, and I, even when I was reviewing it again, I was like, oh, I'd forgotten that there's some really golden nuggets in this interview, so you don't want to miss this, and uh, check out his book, Hearken, O You People. By the way, I have to open this up, because it's got some really cool um, maps that John Hamer put together on both the inside of the front and the back cover um, of the Kirtland area, so anyway... Without any further ado, check out our conversation with Dr. Mark Staker. All right. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents Podcast. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm here with Dr. Mark Staker at the Church History Library, and I appreciate you taking some time uh, to talk to us today here. Well, thank you for including me. All right. So, um, I believe you have a Ph.D. in anthropology, is that correct? It is. I got a Ph.D. in cultural anthropology from the University of Florida. University of Florida. So, go Gators, huh? Yes, yes. <laughs> you were happy with Urban Meyer, the former Ute, and now and then Florida Gator? Uh, he, yeah, he, he's done well for us. So. <laughs> well, great. Um, so, I uh, wanted to talk a little bit about your book, um, The uh, Ohio Revelations. Uh, you probably know the name of it better than I am uh, saying. Hearken, right O ye people. There you yeah, go. The historical setting of Joseph Smith's Ohio Revelations. So it's it's a great book. Um, I've started it. I didn't finish it. But one of the things, uh, especially with February being Black History Month, that I was personally really surprised at was as you started out the book, you started talking about a former slave by the name of Black Pete. So I thought that'd be a great, great place to start here, especially with with Black History Month. So can you tell us a little bit about um, Black Pete? Uh, What what do we know about his earliest life? Uh, Yes, uh, the reason I selected uh, Black Pete to start out with was because he's been ignored as an early member of the church, and I thought it would be a good way to kind of build some of those early events around his life, uh, since he played a a major role, actually, in in some of the early events in Kirtland uh, that had not been uncovered before. And so uh, I focused uh, on... Uh, his childhood, Black Pete is born a slave in uh, Virginia, but the, it's the northern section of Virginia that it becomes part of Pennsylvania as boundaries are adjusted. And so uh, he's, he ends up in uh, Fallowfield, Pennsylvania as a young child. And the reason we know uh, about his mother and his birth is because as they became part of Pennsylvania, they needed to register because Pennsylvania had already established a law uh, manumitting uh, the slaves there over a period of time. And he was just too old by four years uh, to receive manumission as a slave. And so he was bound to be a slave his whole life. Uh, But he was registered uh, with a mother, um, Kino was her name, and uh, her name suggests that she had come from West Africa uh, in uh, the slave, what was called at that time the Slave Coast, and was probably a Muslim uh, background. And so she had raised him in this uh, 
a white community there in, in northern Pennsylvania as a child where he would have grown up uh, working uh, metal for his uh, owners. Uh, there was a, a blacksmithy in the area that he'd worked in and he would have become a skilled uh, slave as that. And, uh, uh, being born just too late uh, to receive manumission from slavery was of course a tragedy for him, but it ended up working out that he got his freedom a year after uh, the other slaves in Pennsylvania did because uh, his slave owner, John Kerr Jr., left in his will that he was to be freed 10 years after his owner's death. And fortunately, his owner died <laughs> when he wasn't uh, too old, and it uh, then allowed Black Pete uh, over a period of time, uh, by 1792, to be freed from slavery. And he um, then was taken into the family, a, a relative family of his owners. Uh, they were Quakers. And Quakers were opposed to slavery, but they weren't opposed to taking advantage of blacks. <laughs> and in this case, uh, that appears to be what happened. Uh, they continued to uh, have him work for them, and essentially he was a slave for the family, even though he had been free. And we don't know the details about how that worked out, but it is clear from the historic record that as he moved to Pennsylvania with the family, and their setting changed, he suddenly changed his attitude, and he became difficult for the, for them to control, and to to make work for them, and. Um, in the terms of the family, he became ugly. So now, which, are you talking about the Kerr family, or is this another family? Uh, well, this is the Kerr family that had um, married I into the Carroll family, it was that Quaker family that I had mentioned that uh, took control of Black Pete, and then they brought him out to Ohio and settled in Kirtland, Ohio. Hercules Carroll, one of the members of that family, had property in, in northern uh, Kirtland, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself because uh, Black Pete's there in Kirtland before he uh, gets control of that property, and Black Pete then uh, gains his, we won't say gains his freedom, he had that, but he, he asserts his freedom uh, from the family and he's able to then act on his own. And he becomes involved in a religious community that's developing there in northern Kirtland. Let me, let me back up just one uh, a second there. So uh, you said he was born just four years too late. When, when was he born? Do you remember? Was it about 1775 or something like that? I, it that right? was, and I don't remember his birth date exactly offhand. But uh, yeah. Okay. But I guess so Pennsylvania had a law for emancipating all slaves that were born... Pennsylvania had a law that would manumit all slaves um, in 1791, but uh, the law was uh, became into effect when it was uh, first uh, issued, uh, which would have been in the 1770s, about the time of uh, the Revolutionary War, and it didn't come into effect until um, it, it didn't include those born before that law was established. Okay. So I think in your book, you weren't sure on the black, on his last name. I think you might have said Carol, but I've heard it was Kerr. Uh, well, often slaves accepted, uh, were, were forced to accept their owner's names as their own name. And it is important, you know, why do we call him Black Pete? That sounds a little condescending uh, today. And his owner, uh, John Kerr Jr., called him John as well. John or Jack, it says in the... Um, oh, so Pete goes by Jack or John as well. Yeah, John's probably his formal name. Jack, uh, slaves were always given diminutive uh, forms of the name, so it's, it's never uh, Peter, it's Pete. It's never John, it's Jack. But John was his name, Jack is what he was called. And then the record suggests, or, as he's sometimes known, Pete. Uh, so Pete appears to be the name that he or his mother selected for him. And uh, when he was registered as a child with his mother, uh, she registered him as Peter. Hmm. And so 
That seems to be the name she preferred. He was only five years old at the time, and so it's probably a name that had come from his mother. Um, Peter would be the formal form, uh, but Peter was the customary uh, usage. Now, did he take the black upon himself, or did other people call him uh, Black Pete? Uh, we don't know, but it seems to have been a, a name that he was comfortable with and used, and people knew him by. And so he, he became known as Black Pete. I uh, didn't use a last name, maybe because he didn't really accept the last names of his owners and preferred to not have a last name. Uh, we don't know. Uh, sometimes slaves did that. They selected, you know, they, they used different names than their owners and they kind of um, asserted some independence that way. <coughs> so this is Black Pete. Um, who comes to Ohio and uh, becomes active in in that region? Okay, so so he he was a slave with Peter with John Kerr Peter Kerr, um, the Kerr family. The Kerr family. <laughs> so then he's so Kerr Mr. Kerr dies. He he associates with some Quakers for a while. Things don't go well with them, and so then what happens? Yeah. So. Uh, John Kerr dies, Mary Kerr then controls him and he moves into the Carroll family. You don't know how that arrangement had, had happened and he comes out to Ohio with the Carroll family. Um, and he then is um, active in the area. He becomes part of what we know of as the, the Morley family. He becomes part of this Reformed Baptist community uh, in northern Kirtland Township, Ohio, where uh, they want to uh, restore original Christianity. And what that means to them is to, they want to create the organization that existed in what they call the primitive church. You know, that you'll have um, a bishop, that you'll have uh, elders, and that you'll have deacons, and that you will uh, organize yourself in the ways that the original Christian community had organized itself. And what that meant for them as they looked at Acts chapter 2 in the New Testament was that they had all things in common, that they would share their goods with each other, and that the Holy Spirit was involved in their lives, which um, they were had to work out what that actually meant, um, and it came to mean, you know, speaking in tongues and uh, being influenced uh, in physical ways uh, by the Spirit. Well, as they were working this out in their uh, religious community, uh, Black Pete, who'd become part of that community, was looked at as chief among them, as uh, one source indicates, or that he became a prophet among them. And it looks like he drew on his own slave background and the slave religion that was, uh, had developed in America, kind of more hidden un, you know, underground. And so it had, a, it had drawn elements from West Africa and elements from uh, the Christian community that they were part of and this amalgamation of different cultural and spiritual and religious beliefs kind of had developed into a, a slave religious tradition that Black Pete apparently was exposed to. And he drew on that in his involvement with this Morty family. Now, in what ways we don't know other than the, what outsiders saw and commented on, and they're interpreting all of this from their Anglo-white, uh, Western American uh, perspective, and so uh, we are, we aren't able to sort out all of the details, but there are some hints, and these hints really come out later on as he uh, becomes part of the of Mormonism, and how that develops is that as part of this Morley family, uh, Black Pete lives with uh, the Whitneys for a while, a uh, new. Kay and Ann Whitney, who have a home uh, in, in Kirtland Village, and he lives on the farm for a while and uh, apparently kind of moves around with different people as 
four missionaries come into Kirtland with copies of the Book of Mormon. Uh, they meet on the Isaac Morley farm and preach uh, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And they talk about the Church of Christ that has been organized April 6th of 1830 in Fayette, New York. And um, that this Church of Christ that we know today as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints um, has authority to preach the gospel and to baptize, and, that there are, and also there's the Book of Mormon that has been translated from an ancient record and that they uh, read to these people. Well, they don't have a lot of copies of the Book of Mormon with them, and they're taking most of those to Missouri, and it looks like uh, just a few copies are left behind in, in Kirtland. Black Pete becomes part of this community, and they don't know a lot, as you can imagine, They've only had a few days interaction with the missionaries. There are a few people that have copies of the Book of Mormon. They don't know a lot about what this Church of Christ is to, to be. You know, what, what are their doctrines? Or what are their practices? Um, largely, they begin, they just continue as um, the Reformed Baptists, the Disciples of Christ, as they call themselves. Um, and they continue the same organization and the same practices that they had before. But they also turned to the Book of Mormon uh, for information, and they turned to Black Pete, who's a revelator among them, but he also seems to be the closest thing to a Native American as they can find. Now, how do you get from Africa to Native American? Because it's the other. You know, he's culturally different. He looks different, and he has a different cultural background. And so when you're trying to figure out how do we live this restored Church of Christ, well, we look to Native Americans because they're the Lamanites, you know, and what do Native Americans do? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm getting a little ahead of myself because this develops over a several month period. Uh, these Mormon missionaries baptize uh, most of the members of the Morty family. And Black Pete, um, participates in all this. He's preaching and helping with baptisms later on. So we have to assume that he's baptized and that he's ordained a priest as well, along with the rest of these in, in individuals, that, you know, the, the men that are, are converted in this community, because uh, nobody actually says uh, those things about him. But he's clearly part of this community, and he's part of of what's going on. So, just want to stop there for a second. So, we don't have a, a priesthood ordination certificate or anything, but it seems likely that he probably did hold the yeah. priesthood. We don't. We don't have a, a smoking gun that says Black Pete was ordained to the priesthood and became a priest. And D the, does anyone refer to him as an elder or deacon or anything uh, like no, that? No. No. He's a prophet among them. He's chief among them. So he has some kind of a, a leadership role, but he. Uh, there's no a actual ordination certificate that says he was ordained to the priest. So that's interesting that he's a chief among them. Uh, I guess that's kind of an Indian chief kind of a... Well, it, yeah, yeah it could be could be looked at that way. I, I've understood it generally as being principal, he, that he has a lot of authority and influence among them, but it could be also keen off on that Indian idea because, indeed, they do look to uh, him for influence on uh, how do how you behave as, as an Indian. And they're, so they are, are running around the hills uh, doing these pantomime scalping things because they know stories about that, you know, kind of bloody and gory kind of things. But they're also um, jumping up on tree stumps. And this is a new area, so there, there are tree stumps everywhere. You know, they're jumping up on tree stumps and preaching to the people kind of out in the dark. And they're rolling down hills uh, because the spirit has influenced them. And over time, they seem to be incorporating some new things as well, uh, such as speaking in tongues. And what kind of tongues are they speaking in? Indian tongues. They're speaking Indian. Now, uh, we don't have any you know, recordings of these early discussions as to what Indian might sound like to them, and whether, uh, but there are people in their community that had been out west living among Native American communities, including uh, Nilke Whitney, the store leader, who had, had been a trader 
out of Michigan with, uh, with Native Americans there. And they insisted, oh yeah, these are Indian languages. Um, uh, so there, were, there was that focus. And later on, uh, it shifts a bit to talking about Adamic languages. Uh, they're speaking Adamic, but in this early period, it's Indian that they're focused on because of that Book of Mormon connection. Now, I've heard in this early time period that there were uh, Methodists, I believe, that uh, did a lot of speaking in tongues. Is, is that true, or was that more of a Baptist thing? You know, I looked and looked through the source material to find early accounts of speaking in tongues before this happens, even among the Shakers, uh, because it's a Shaker practice as well, the speaking in tongues. And I couldn't find anything before uh, Black Pete's introduction of this hmm. uh, in the Mormon community. Now, Shakers pick up on it, and within a couple of years in a nearby community, they are practicing speaking in tongues, and they talk about it being a new thing, wow. that they hadn't been doing that before. So is this so. something that you think that Black Pete may have introduced to the Mormons in Kirtland, is speaking in tongues? Is that I like believe he did. Oh, wow. I, I, it's a circumstantial case. Uh, there's nobody that says that, but uh, as you look at the evidence as to where it comes from and these early attempts to practice it, speaking Indian, um, that it seems to have come from him. Uh, it's uh, abolished, put out of the community, and then it comes back uh, a, a couple of years later. And we'll get back, back to that in a bit because it's rather interesting how that happens. But uh, they, they do other things, Book of Mormon things. You know, they pantomime going down the river in canoes and Basically, it's a, what, do, what little information do we know about Indians and uh, what does Black Pete suggest to us about uh, religion and kind of combining that together and that's what they're doing. It's, for, it's just for a short period, a couple of months, but it really has a dramatic impact on them as a community and also on the surrounding community because they come to think of this, this is what Mormons are like. So is this based on the idea of the Book of Mormon, where the Lamanites are Native Americans, and so they're trying to tie current Native American practices to the Book of Mormon? Yeah, yeah, okay. exactly. They, wow. that's well, the Book of Mormon uh, is about these Indians, you know, anciently, and so we're interested in kind of whatever they're doing today um, must be what the Book of Mormon people did earlier. And, of course, it's uh, largely a fantasy in terms of what they're doing today, things such as scalping and stuff. It's kind of more of the popular mind uh, that ends up kind of in their, in their behavior, but it's, uh, it, it's not direct observation and it's not good information you know, that, that they've incorporated, but it does um, influence outside perceptions of them. Uh, one intriguing uh, tantalizing detail because uh, people commented on it from outside the community and that is they talk about them practicing free love and what does that mean well what they know about Indians is that they are polygynous that they the men in Indian communities have more than one wife and so it appears that that also there are a number of sources you kind of have to weave together to that suggest that uh, something like that is going on as well within this community, that they're practicing this and that later revelations specifically address this issue at hand um, in their community. And so that's also something that Black Pete may have been influenced on. There are several uh, individuals that later suggest that he's involved in, in all this and they, they're, they're outsiders suggesting it in a negative way context, but uh, is understandable because of uh, the slave community that his mother came from and that most of his associates came from practiced uh, polygamy of, of some sort in their traditional cultures, you know, they brought with them from West Africa. And so uh, there are some tr intriguing questions there, and we don't really have good answers. Uh, to most of those questions at this point. I have to continue to look through the data and see if there's more information that might help shed light on, on that. But Black Pete's part of this community. He's part of um, this religious enthusiasm that develops 
between the time the missionaries arrive in Kirtland on November 2nd of 1830 and early January of 1831 when the first individuals from New York start arriving with John Whitmer being Do, the first. Oh, because so John Whitmer was one of the missionaries? John Whitmer, um, Peter Whitmer is one of the first four missionaries that stop briefly and then head on west, but John Whitmer is sent by Joseph Smith to Kirtland to provide leadership to this community. So he's the first one that comes that actually has experience as a a, a long-time member, meaning long six, time, months, six months, <laughs> a six-month member of the church. And he, he, he has some copies of the Book of Mormon he brings with him, and so now they're actually getting good information. Uh, he, ha he has also has a manuscript of the Book of Moses uh, that we have today as part of the Pearl of Great Price that he has uh, most of, if not all of that, with him as well. So he has some scriptures, he has instructions, and he can provide some leadership, albeit uh, it, you know, a very inexperienced leadership himself. But from that point, uh, the community begins to shift a little bit. And the, they pull away from the religious enthusiasm, uh, which means, you know, the speaking in tongues, the being overpowered by the Spirit, rolling around on the floor, and, and other kinds of behaviors uh, that they're doing. Uh, but they don't shift away enough from that. When Joseph Smith arrives uh, on February 4th of 1831, it's still very much a part of elements of the community and then that's when Joseph begins to receive revelations immediately on that subject that acknowledge that the gifts of the Spirit are important but provides direction on that. Um, so uh, Let me ask you about one of the things that you wrote in your book, because I, I wanted to kind of know when, when this came. So one of the things you mentioned in your book was the fact that uh, Black Pete had an angel, a, a letter from heaven from a black angel. Could, could you talk about that? I, those, those activities are important because they suggest some things about his involvement with African religious tradition as well, and that is that part of this religious enthusiasm is, that was going on is that they were receiving uh, letters from angels, but these letters uh, provided them authority as well. Oliver Cowdery, when he first comes to Ohio, says that he has seen an angel and that they have authority. Um, we understand that today to mean, you know, John the Baptist, he's, he talks about John the Baptist having come and given authority to baptize. And that this receiving letters from heaven is a play off of that. They're also receiving kind of authority and direction to, to do things. And so uh, they, they follow on that. And these letters um, appear to be uh, ethereal. They're not they're not tangible, they're not things that other people see, but the, only the person that receives it, you know, comes down and they're able to see that and read that letter and, and act. But they're also, Black Pete uh, seems to uh, put kites up in the sky and he's flying things that, uh, that uh, have faces of various kinds. And it seems that he's, that this is part of the African uh, tradition that his uh, mother brought with her a West African religious tradition, um, and there are uh, African potters uh, who will put faces on pots. Now they introduced that into the American potting uh, tradition, the pottery tradition, and it appears that uh, Black Pete's kind of keying in on some of that as well. And these letters coming down from heaven. This idea of flying. Some people say, "Oh, he claims he can fly." That's part of that uh, slave religious tradition, uh, where some people can fly at night. They leave their bodies to do it, uh, typically. But it, it appears that he uh, believes that that's something that he can do as well because of his previous religious background as a child or before he gets to Ohio. So those are elements that also um, kind of come into the, the story as he uh, 
moves forward. Now Joseph Smith, when he arrives in Kirtland and begins to receive a revelation, it dismantles this ecstatic religious tradition that has been introduced and the religious enthusiasm that, that's going on to an extent. Uh, it stops. Uh, no more speaking in tongues, uh, no more rolling around. It takes a, a little bit of time to do that. and. Um, uh, so they're still, even after Joseph arrives, you know, they ha hold a, a special priesthood meeting up in the schoolhouse on the Morty Farm, and some of that, uh, those events continue to happen. Um, uh, but uh, not long after that, they, they disappear from the community. And it turns out that a couple of those early converts that head off on a mission uh, to the east uh, baptize Brigham Young. Wow. And Brigham Young is introduced to speaking in tongues in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, by these missionaries that are they're serving in Pennsylvania, but they move up north and they introduce it in Pennsylvania as well. And uh, it's Brigham Young that brings that tradition back to Kirtland. Uh, it's died out, and when he comes there, he speaks in tongues at a meeting at the Johnson Inn. It's a, the local tavern there at the crossroads and on the upper floor of the tavern they hold this church meeting and here he's speaking in tongues and Joseph Smith declares it to be of God and that introduces it back into the community and it, oh, it wow. spreads so, to uh, so how long was it out of favor there in Kirtland approximately uh, approximately a year okay. almost a year that they're not practicing so it's still very much in people's memory and uh, there may be some people still practicing it. I may be uh, overstating the case by saying it has died out, but there's no evidence that it's continuing until Brigham Young uh, brings it back in to the community. And there's some suggestion by some late, you know, that came about at the same time that he introduces it to the community because they're not aware of this earlier practice. And so that supports the idea that it, it has died out. People aren't aware of it until he introduces it back in. To the community, and so speaking in comes in tongues comes back into the community. But Black Pete doesn't seem to be taking as central a role in anymore in what's going on. Uh, is it because Joseph Smith arrives? He's the prophet and he's the leader, so they don't look to Black Pete as a prophet. Or is it because there's some negative backlash from this earlier? Um, experience of uh, the ecstatic religious tradition that he introduces into the community. I don't know. Um, well, let, me, let me tie into that again. So, so he joins the church, if I recall, is about November of 1830. Yeah. So it's less than six months after. And then, uh, as I recall in your book, didn't, didn't he go on a mission or something? And there's a, something, in, I don't even know where Ashtabula is. Is that close by? Ashtabula is a good a day's journey uh, for them uh, east of, of where they're at. And um, uh, he and three other individuals, they all uh, call themselves on missions. Well, no, let me step back. Everybody that joins the church, everybody meaning, in this case, the men that join the church are expected to go out and preach the gospel. And they're ordaining them elders. Uh, John Murdoch, when he's baptized, uh, he's immediately ordained an elder, and he goes out, never having read the Book of Mormon, having no idea what the church is really all about, other than that he knows what Oliver Cowdery's told them about authority and about the angel Moroni and things coming. And so presumably he's sharing that information with people. Um, there's some discussion of uh, Christ appearing in America, and so they're telling some of the stories you know, from the Book of Mormon. Uh, but he's going out and he baptizes up within a week 70 individuals. And the, this is John, John Murdoch. Murdoch. Okay. And so others are, are, are out, they're preaching, they're baptizing quite a few people. Uh, Black Pete is one of these individuals that goes out and is preaching as well. He um, he joins three other individuals and they all go as uh, this group of four that are very interested in, in religious enthusiasm. And so that might be what 
ties them together. But what this also suggests is that since those that we know about were ordained elders, such as John Murdoch, um, it could be that Black Pete had been ordained an elder as well to go out, and um, and he's assigned to preach just like these others are is supposed to go out and preach. But he, he clearly is doing that. So, do we have any record that he baptized anyone? Or I actually had somebody ask me: uh, Is it likely that if he did baptize, that they were white people or black people? Do you know that? Um, a great question, and I don't know uh, their race, but it does is the. He, uh, this group of four are baptizing people, so presumably he is one of those baptizing individuals. Okay, so he went out with John Murdoch, and do you know who the other well, two is, are? Well, is, uh, Burr Riggs uh, is the one that he's most closely associated with, and then a couple of other individuals that, that go out with them. Uh, John Murdoch's out on his own. It doesn't, at least as far as I can tell, he doesn't have a companion uh, while he's preaching. Um, and they don't really get that instruction to go out two by two until a few months later. Okay, so it sounds like we've got better documentation for John Murdoch than we do for black people. Well, we, John Murdoch's journal survives, Oh, uh, his missionary journal. And so the, where he's going, who he's preaching to, how many individuals he's baptizing, uh, he records that in his journal. Uh, if Black Pete kept a journal, uh, it doesn't survive. Uh, some of his associates say he was illiterate which seems to make some sense because it was illegal for uh, slaves to learn to read, and so he probably didn't read, learn to read when he was younger. Um, but then again, he's receiving these letters from heaven. Um, but if they're, you know, if they're spiritual letters, maybe he doesn't need to actually know how to read to read these letters either. So those are questions that we really can't answer. From but at any rate, he, he ended up in a newspaper. Is that right? He ends up in the, the he, a bunch of a bunch of newspapers mention him. A bunch, yeah, you know, because he's colorful, he's um, different, and if you want to write negative things about the Mormons, he becomes a lightning rod to do that. And so, because of that, he ends up casting a little bit of a negative light on Mormonism. Uh, you know, he claims that he can fly. Ha ha ha, you know, look at what these Mormons believe. Uh, he ends up running off of a cliff and kind of falling down into the trees. Look at these silly things Mormons are doing. Uh, he was chasing after one of these letters when that happened, you know, and so he kind of wasn't paying attention to what was in front of him. Um, he's doing the other things that seem to be a little bit. Uh, odd or strange, look what these Mormons believe. And so he becomes kind of the lightning rod of negative focus. And the fact that he's black uh, also adds to the negativity because most of the people in the Western Reserve there in Northeastern Ohio don't, uh, don't look kindly toward blacks. Most of those, you know, the white settlers, and there aren't that many black, free blacks in the community at the time. And so, so it all just adds to kind of that negative patina, and that's why he's selected as the person that they mention most often in, in the record. And that's how we're able to learn things about him, but it also adds to the um, likelihood that when Joseph Smith comes and when they establish uh, the, the church kind of more formally there in Kirtland, that he's going to be kind of pushed more into the background because he's added, the, he's become this negative focus. And so sadly, um, over time, he, over a very short period of time, he disappears from the record. And we don't know what happens to him. Uh, where did he go? Did he stay there? It doesn't seem to. Uh, there, There's no a black person in the census records and the other local uh, records that seems to fit him uh, after this period of time. Um, but I can't figure out where he's gone to. It would be great to be able to follow him through and, and figure out you know, the later parts of his life and how Mormonism continues or doesn't continue to influence in him or how he continues to find, uh, you know, meaning in the rest of his life, but uh, he he disappears from the record. Hmm. 
Okay, one other story I just want to highlight really quickly is uh, <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, uh, he, well, he sort of had a romantic relationship with uh, Frederick Williams' daughter, if I recall. Can you, can you talk about that? Well, I, I think it was less romantic than it was a hopeful romance on his part. Um, and that there are some of the um, some of the women that he associates, well, all of the women that he's associated with are white uh, because he appears to be the only black person, as far as we know, that's part of this community. And he's interested in marriage, um, and he claims to have received a revelation to marry uh, uh, one of the Williams' daughters, and she says, you know, when I receive a revelation, well and good, but uh, she didn't feel that she'd received a revelation to do the same. And um, uh, the same story that many sorry young men have <laughs> suggested over their lives is they, they receive revelation that a young woman doesn't receive in, in, in terms of marriage. But uh, she didn't receive the same revelation. She turned down his marriage proposal. Um, he later wants Joseph Smith to receive revelation on his behalf to marry somebody. And as far as we know, that never happened. Um, and, you know, and he's, he doesn't get married within the community, and we don't know, you know where, where he went from there. So that's, a, uh, that's just one of those stories that is told, but it also kind of fits within the larger free love story that um, is often told by outsiders. And the hints that perhaps there was some discussion of polygamy there at the time, but um, but it's hard to sort out really how that all happened. Now, wasn't there a big age difference as well between? Yeah, he would have been twice twice the age of of the young lady that he was hoping to marry. So. Okay, so that probably didn't sit too well with very many people, besides the fact of his race. Uh, per, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that that probably was a factor as well, but uh, yeah, we don't know because we don't have any responses how that all played out. Well, I know uh, I, I spoke with Paul Reeve uh, recently, and he talked about amalgamation, uh, mixed race marriage was a an awful thing both in the South and in the North. You know, Ohio would be considered the North, obviously. Um, w was there any talk about that uh, in the early early early? <coughs> um, no, and uh, he's correct. It would be national news, and it did happen occasionally. It ended up in the national papers that some white person married a, a black person. Uh, but Emma's aunt had done exactly that. Emma Smith? Emma Smith's aunt, aunt, uh, aunt the Hill, had married uh, Joseph Wallace, a black man. Oh, I did not know um, that. Uh, nobody did. They kept it quiet. It wasn't even, by law, they had to announce it in the newspaper. The marriage, uh, but they didn't mention race, of course, in that wow. official announcement. It, is, it, it was very difficult to, to sort that out. Uh, he comes from a, uh, the Wallace family uh, were Revolutionary War heroes. You know, they were part of the black uh, freedom fighters that had fought in that war. He appears to be a successful, uh, comfortable individual in the community. Uh, she elected to marry him. I, it, it caused a stir in their religious denomination, um, and then we can't find out any, or at least I haven't been able to find out any more about what happened after that or where they go or anything. They kind of disappear from the so, records. So Emma didn't talk about it, so it sounds like she didn't really approve of that? I don't know. Don't she know. approved or didn't approve or... Um, yeah, those are things. That I, I know talking with Paul, the, 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 one of the big knocks against Mormons was the fact that they were so open to, well, I know that they married Indians, and it sounds like they were a lot more open to even mixed race marriages. Uh, could well have been. Could well have been early on open to those kinds of things. And, uh, wow. But don't know. Well, that's interesting. Wish, wish we knew a little bit more about what happened after Kirtland with him, but that's, these, are, these are fascinating insights. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit more about the Kirtland area. What are some of the um, important revelations uh, that, that happened in Kirtland as, as Joseph Smith came? Uh, when Joseph Smith came to Kirtland, 
uh, he understood that the Lord would reveal his law to the people. That he's going to he's going to come to his temple. He's going to reveal his law. They're together to the Ohio. Um, how all that's going to unfold, where these things are going to happen, is not uh, entirely clear. The temple is going to be in Missouri. They learn very early on, um, and there's no talk even about uh, uh, Kirtland Temple, you know, at the beginning. And, uh, but uh, the first thing that, that they do is get together twelve elders and receive the law of the Lord. And the law of the Lord essentially restates uh, most of the Ten Commandments and the importance of living those commandments and focuses particularly on uh, marriage and um, you know, and purity and chastity and so on, which is followed up with, a, with another um, revelation that suggests to me uh, that it's a response to what Black Pete has introduced in terms of uh, polygamy at the time. Um, so wait a minute, you're, you're telling me that Black, that Black Pete may have been responsible for introducing polygamy into the Kirtland community? Um, I believe so. Oh. And I believe that's why um, often, you know, we say, well, Joseph Smith was translating the Bible and he wants to know about Abraham, you know, and his wives and... Isaac and Jacob and plural wives, and so he asked that. Well, everybody knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but nobody else is really asking those. Well, few people are asking those kinds of questions. Some are, um, but I, I believe that there was uh, specific issues at hand that led Joseph Smith to ask uh, those kinds of questions about marriage and Abraham and Isaac and so on. And I believe that Black Pete introduced that eye to him. I did to him. Now, uh, do, is there a re, uh, step by step process that we can document as to how that happened? No. It's a, it's a circumstantial case. Wow. Wow. This is, this is great. <laughs> I'm learning all sorts of stuff here. Um, so, Dr. Lawrence Foster from Georgia Tech um, has mentioned that he believes back clear back as 1831 so i'm thinking this is probably the kirtland time frame that there was some revelation which i don't believe has been published and i don't i'd really like to learn more about it um that uh, joseph smith may have had a revelation to uh do polygamous marriages among indians are, are you familiar with that uh, yes um there's a joseph smith it looks like from the best information we've got uh when he arrives in Kirtland, you know, by that fall, he's received revelations on plural marriage already. In 1831. In 1831. And what he dictates later in Nauvoo is a portion of that, or a, a reworking of that, or a, a different understanding of that, you know, that's expanded and, 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 um, and more refined. But Clearly, uh, many individuals, Brigham Young, uh, Joseph F. Smith, uh, Orson Pratt, all indicate that in 1831, Joseph receives his revelation on polygamy. And that's it, I believe, in response to what's going on in this Morty family uh, beforehand, and that Joseph needs to clarify that and understand that. And so it begins with the law uh, right then in February of 1831, but then by that fall, Joseph's receiving more information and how he comes to understand that Native Americans will be part of that. It could be, since they're trying to, you know, the, the Morty family is trying to live Native American practices and they would say, oh, Native Americans practice plural marriage. To me, it's a very natural context for him to come to understand that, but however that happened, um, by the time they go to Missouri, uh, W.W. Phelps suggests that uh, they're talking about the redemption of the Lamanites, and Joseph Smith uh, suggests to Martin Harris that he could marry one of uh, these uh, and these Indians and help bring her into uh, the community and 
and um, Martin Harris suggests, well, he's already married, or well, W.W. Phelps suggests that, I forget which of the two, and Joseph suggests that, hmm. that polygamy may be a way that they can do that. So, so how does that tie in with the Book of Mormon? Because I believe, and I, I don't have the time wrong, but I believe about 1829, 1830, the Book of Mormon was published, and in, in Jacob it says you're not supposed to do polygamy. How do, how do, how do we reconcile that? How do we reconcile that, or did they? How did the, both? <laughs> um, I probably, in a similar way, in that uh, Jacob suggests that you're not to practice this unless, you know, I, I, I will build up a righteous people unto me. Otherwise, you're to, to live these things. And so that it's a commandment that has specific exceptions. That if I want to build a righteous people to me, you know, for a period of time I can command this. Otherwise, the standard, the common, is to uh, practice monogamy. That's the Lord's common. Um, that's what Jacob in the Book of Mormon suggests, is this is what you're to do, unless, you know, in this specific instance, uh, there's an exception, and then he allows for the exception. Um, and I suspect that that, that exception was uh, something that they discussed as early members of the church, but I don't know if even they, they focused on that. Mm -hmm. You know, if they just read over that and didn't worry, I don't know. So, as I understand it, there's a, and I, I wish I could remember what section it was in the Doctrine and Covenants, but there, it, and I believe it was in the Kirtland period where Joseph Smith says, hey, no more polygamy, it's monogamy, it's the, the law. Uh, I mean, can you, can you talk about the circumstances of that? Uh, am I getting it right? Well, in Kirtland, has, um, there are, uh, in the Elder's Journal, Joseph defends the church from accusations of polygamy. And some scholars have suggested, well, nobody's making accusations of polygamy. You know, why is he defending the church against that? It's because of his own, you know, he, he's had the revelations and he's trying to uh, to respond to that. I think that his his um, defense against accusations of polygamy suggests that there were accusations leveled uh, out there uh, because of the Black Pete and because of the um, Morty family experience. Uh, so that's what the Elder's Journal is responding to in Kirtland, where they're saying, well, these things happened earlier, uh, but that's not part of us. We don't support polygamy. So the Elder's Journal is that? The Elder's Journal is a newspaper okay. that they're publishing in uh, Kirtland, Ohio. Okay, by the, by the Elder's Church. By the Church. Or the Church of Christ, I guess, and, they were known back Yeah, but by the, the, La the Church of the Latter-day Saints by that time. Yeah, because they had several iterations of name changes, as I recall. They did, yes. So, so it was originally the Church of Christ, and then the Church of the Latter Day Saints. Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter Day okay. Saints. So. And then, how, what what's the time frame for all those name changes? Do you know? Um, boy, it'd be hard for me to give you really accurate dates on that because I haven't focused on it uh, with any specificity. But it's in the 1834 to 1836 time period that they kind of shift from that one to the other as Joseph receives revelations on how the church should be called. And then do you know which section of the Doctrine and Covenants it is that, uh, and, and approximately when it was where they said, because as I recall it says something with that, inasmuch as this church has been charged with a crime of polygamy or something along those lines, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Uh, that has since, yeah, it was a, uh, the Declaration on Marriage right. that was That's included in the Doctrine and Covenants initially and then removed uh, later on. Um, yeah, and Oliver Cowdery um, was involved in putting that in, and, the, and there's some dispute, some uh, disagreement among historians as to how, whether Joseph played a role in that or whether he didn't. Um, but... Uh, Oliver Cowdery took the leadership in that, um, in terms of inserting this declaration into the Doctrine and Covenants that we that uh, that marriage is important to us. It, it could actually be brought back in and included today because it fits with um, the way we understand marriage today as a Latter-day Saints, you know, between a husband and wife, and and so on. 
Could you see that being recanonized? Um, I, yes, I definitely could see it being brought back in and hmm. put back in. The and so Oliver Cowdery was more of an inspiration for that section than Joseph? Well, uh, some have suggested that. Uh, Brigham Young uh, believed that it was all Oliver Cowdery's doing. Um, did he know all the details? Some of dis you know, scholars, some scholars have disputed that. Uh, some have accepted his hmm. uh, his declaration. I tend to believe that Brigham Young did know enough about those details that he was right that Oliver Cowdery had played the principal, if not the sole role, in getting that material. Included. Wow, that's very interesting. Well, great. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk. A what are what, I go back to some of the other? What are some of the other important uh, revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants that we have from this Kirtland kind of time period? Joseph Smith receives revelations in batches during specific periods of time. When he was in Harmony, Pennsylvania, working on the Book of Mormon, he received quite a few revelations. And then when he gets to Kirtland, Ohio. He receives a significant number of revelations. Um, what I find intriguing is that once he leaves Kirtland, the number of revelations Joseph receives uh, drops significantly. That the later sections of the Doctrine and Covenants are minutes from meetings or extracts from journals from people of things that Joseph taught. I uh, even section 132, which Joseph dictated in Nauvoo, most of, if not uh, almost all of it, uh, is drawing on his Kirtland revelatory experiences rather than anything that he might have uh, received uh, later on. And I think it suggests some things about Kirtland being uh, this um, catalyst to the revelatory experiences for Joseph. Uh, and most of those revelations address questions that they had at the, the, the time, and the majority of them are received in response to the, I was going to say the temple that they're constructing, but initially they don't quite understand it as a temple. The Joseph Smith meets regularly with a number of priesthood holders in what they call the School of the Prophets. The School of the Prophets uh, uses language from New England and from that Puritan past. Uh, it's a training ground for ministers or for individuals who are uh, particularly interested in becoming more righteous, more in, in tune with the Bible or, or, or aligning their lives more with living the Bible, rather than saying a training ground for people who actually want to be prophets, so, you know, as we might understand that. Um, but the School of the Prophets meets regularly in the Newell K. Whitney's store, in the upper floor of uh, N.K. Whitney's store, and as they discuss having another space to meet, they're talking about it as a school. They're going to build a schoolhouse. And they talk about building this school of logs. And uh, Lucy Mack Smith shares that story in her biography of Joseph Smith coming in and saying, you know, are we going to build a house to our Lord of logs? You know, the Lord has a better plan for us, you know, something more grand. And, and he reveals uh, information about building, you know, what we now call the temple. Well, it was still a schoolhouse. It just wasn't a, to be a log schoolhouse. It was to be something grander. And a schoolhouse, by then, you have to understand that when minis, uh, missionaries were going out and preaching, they, they often met in schoolhouses to preach. That was a gathering place for Latter-day Saints. And they, they were holding meetings at that very time uh, down in the red schoolhouse in the Kirtland Flats. Uh, that's where con the congregation was meeting uh, for the Kirtland Saints, and so schools were a place for congregational worship as well. And as this schoolhouse that they're going to build in Kirtland, uh, as an understanding of it develops, uh, they're calling it the House of the Lord. Uh, but it's still primarily uh, it's primarily uh, its purpose is to be a school. 
Now, uh, as they are going to build this school, this house of the Lord, uh, they plan on it being a specific size and having a specific look based on Revelation. And Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams have a revelation where they see this building kind of come over them as they're, they're laying down on the ground and look up into the sky. And what they see looks remarkably like the temple that they have planned for Missouri. Uh, there are sketches of the temple to be built in Missouri that survive. Uh, not any sketches for a, a temple or another structure in Kirtland, but those uh, sketches for the, the uh, temple in Independence, Missouri, look very similar to the Kirtland Temple that we eventually get. And what they do is they um, build this according to Revelation. The dimensions are provided by Revelation and the large uh, details of, of the building are provided by Revelation. But, and those revelations are in the, in the Doctrine and Covenants, but also a lot of the other revelations being received about that same period of time are addressing the temple, and we don't understand that today because we think, oh, this is about priesthood. You know, section uh, 88 of the Doctrine and Covenants, for example. Um, that's the Oath and Covenant of the priesthood, yeah. right? We know that as... Well, we, we, we know that's all about priesthood. And when it was published, its, uh, its title was On Priesthood, you know, and, and, and it, was, it, it did address priesthood. But, but why priesthood? Why suddenly... All this information that's coming out about how the priesthood is traced back, and it provides names, the Aaronic priesthood and the Melchizedek priesthood. Before that, it was the lesser priesthood and the greater priesthood. Now we have these names for these uh, authorities, and Joseph Smith receives uh, revelations on quorums, and that you have to have presidents of these quorums, and how this is all to be organized, and he's ordained as the president of the high priesthood. And this is all unfolding uh, at the same time that they're moving forward on this building to be built in in Kirtland. And lo and behold, the, sh the structure of the internal uh, areas of that building all decry priesthood. Or I, I shouldn't say decry, they... they um, they support, they, they cry out priesthood, that they, they um, declare priesthood. You have priesthood pulpits that uh, declare this uh, authority, priesthood authority from uh, the deacon, the presidency of the deacon's quorum, and the presidency of the teacher's quorum, the presidency of the priest quorum, all on the east side of the temple. And then on the west side, you have the presidency of the elders' quorum and the presidency of the... Um, the Melchizedek priesthood, and then you have the presidency of the high priesthood of the church, uh, which is a little bit different than the Melchizedek priesthood at the time, but uh, those are all uh, priesthood authorities that are visually incorporated into this uh, building. And the benches in there are movable, so you can move uh, to face one side or the other as each of these priesthoods uh, speak, and they're essentially given equal uh, focus, you know, that you can turn one way or you can turn the other, and that this is all priesthood authority. And at the same time, Joseph Smith then starts talking about priesthood restoration, and that's when we first, we get those earliest accounts of um, John the Baptist coming and restoring the Aaronic priesthood, and, and then early mentions of other authority. Now, Oliver Cowdery, when he first arrived, had talked about authority and authority from an angel uh, as early as November of 1830. Uh, but we don't have the details of that because that wasn't shared. But these are recorded accounts. And it's so important that they're publishing it in the paper and giving more detailed information on it than they had earlier. Um, so where it might have been an incidental part of the narrative before, now it's becoming the focus of the narrative, that priesthood is important. And then the house of the Lord also becomes um, more than just a schoolhouse. It is the schoolhouse. It's the school of the elders meets there, you know, instead of what they were calling the school of the prophets before. And the name is changing a little bit, but they're 
uh, they're also holding other kinds of meetings, such as um, to study Hebrew. And they have the Hebrew school, and they hire a teacher to come in and teach them Hebrew. Uh, they're studying grammar, and they're studying um, a composition and writing, and they're studying these other things. And it becomes so influential that um, the local community starts meeting down in the schoolhouse on the flats, and they organize an adult education program where they're trying to do some of the same things. Theirs ends up failing after just a couple of days. Um, they're not able to do it. But uh, this is uh, this is before adult education becomes um, widely practiced in America. Uh, this is some of those earliest efforts to do that, and it's all part of this uh, Kirtland schoolhouse, Kirtland House of the Lord experience. And it's not until uh, after the building is dedicated, uh, then Jesus Christ appears there. And where he had promised earlier, behold, suddenly I come to my temple. Well, now he's doing that in a building. Um, and Moses and Elias and Elijah appear in this building and they bring keys. Um, Joseph already held the priesthood authority. They're not bringing authority. Um, he had all the authority he needed with Peter, James, and John, but they're bringing these keys that allow him then to use that authority in, in some more specific ways. Um, that all happens in this building. So what is this building? It's more than just the house of the Lord. It's more than a schoolhouse. It's a temple. And it gets that name after that time. Uh, people can, uh, begin to call it a temple. And it's now, today we think of it as the Kirtland Temple. But it was a growing process to get to that point. And it wasn't until the Savior appeared there uh, that people came to really understand that. Wow. In that context. I guess that's one of the interesting things to me. You, you brought up so many questions that I wanted to ask. Um, because the, the Kirtland Temple was a lot more open than, you know, our modern temples are. It was more of a gathering place. You mentioned it was a school. You know, there's that, that scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants, that says uh, the temple should be a house of learning, a house of faith. This literally was a house of learning. They taught grammar. Um, and so it's interesting to me, because our, our concept of temples has changed so much since those early days of Kirtland. Um, it's interesting to me to hear you say that this was more of an evolution. It wasn't like, oh, let's build a temple, and this is what, you know. Baptism for the dead wasn't even there. No. Yep, they're learning out of the best books. They're learning, that is a house of learning. Um, uh, temples still are that today, but in a, a much more refined sort of way than they understood it more as that all learning took, took place in this building, and, um, and that, that was one of the primary uh, emphasis of that building was was that learning that took place in there. So, so you you mentioned uh, Elijah coming. That that I believe was 1836, just a few months after the temple was dedicated. Um, I was talking with uh, with Dr. Bennett at BYU, and I mentioned that um, that revelation wasn't known for about 40 years after that. Um, why do you why do you think that one was was kept quiet for so long? Well, there are uh, Joseph did mention it orally, and I mentioned in my book a couple of uh, people later remembering. You know, uh, Marianne Stearns uh, remembers her mother taking her up to the pulpit there in Kirtland and saying, "This is where Joseph said this happened." Um, so he did. But people didn't rush out to write all this stuff down. They weren't as good at you know writing down everything as um, maybe happens today. Uh, and Joseph dictated right after it happened. He dictated the whole account to his scribe, uh, who wrote it down carefully in his journal, and it was there. Uh, but it wasn't published until after Joseph's death, long after his death. Uh, when the Latter-day Saints got out to Utah, that they published that first in the Deseret News uh, newspaper, and then eventually it was drawn into the Doctrine and Covenants. But uh, during Joseph's life, he didn't share it in detail. Um, I have my theories as to why that's the case, but they're just speculation on my part. Um, but my 
My feeling is that when Peter, James, and John appeared to Joseph Smith and restored the Melchizedek priesthood, that it was to be a confidential event, that they taught him things and gave him instruction that he was to share with no one, and that it was only to be shared within, within a certain sacred context. And when Joseph Smith's building the Nauvoo Temple, he talks about, when the temple is finished, I will share with you some of these details. But he talks about uh, restoration of the priesthood. You know, as the temple is being finished, and he's there in front of the temple at a, he holds a meeting and he has a, a reads a prepared uh, sermon. Actually, he's sick and his <laughs> scribe has to read it uh, for him. Uh, but he, he's talking about, um, he's drawing on that Peter, James, and John experience, but doesn't feel that he can share it all. I think that because Peter, James, and John and what happens in the Kirtland Temple with Moses and Elias and Elijah are also integrally uh, tied together, and I think that they all have temple connections, that Joseph Smith doesn't share that information at that time. He's waiting until the Navi Temple is built to share that, and he's not around you know, when that, what's, that's finally dedicated, and so, uh, so it doesn't happen. Uh, that's all speculation on my part, and I have no idea what the hmm. what the truth is hmm. on that. So. so, with that vision, I think uh, Elder Bednar <clears throat> a few years ago talked about that that was so important to the the sealing power. Um, you know, that's when we say that Joseph received the sealing power. Well, jumping back to a little bit to polygamy, I believe. So this is 1836 when Elijah came. Is that right? So I'm trying to go back, we'll go back to the, the controversial stuff in Kirtland. You know, there's the uh, question about Fanny Alger and, and whether she was sealed to Joseph as a, as a polygamous wife. Um, that would have occurred before this sealing, is that right? The sealing before, before Elijah appears. Right. It occurs before Elijah appears. I believe that Joseph Smith receives from Peter, James, and John all the authority that he needs, including the sealing power, that he holds all those uh, through Peter, James, and John. What Elijah brings is keys, keys to enact those sealing powers on behalf of other individuals. That doesn't mean that Joseph can't use those, that same authority on his own behalf. He can't seal himself um, to Fanny. Now, he has somebody else, at least Moses Hancock su suggests that, uh, that Joseph has, has uh, a member of the Hancock family marry him and Fanny. Um, but we don't know all the details of that and how Joseph would have sealed himself to her or not. And so, um, so I can't really say more than that other than that I don't think that saying, well, Joseph was sealed to her before he had the sealing power holds up because I think he received all that authority from Peter, James, and John long before. He just received the keys after. Now, does that mean he, ha he could enact a sealing beforehand? Well, apparently, because he does, he does that with, with Fanny, at least you know, even non you know, former Mormons, that uh, he, the church suggests that Joseph was sealed to to Fanny, or that you know that they had married each other, and uh, but what what that all means, I don't know. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying. So you're saying that clear back in 1830 or so, when Peter, James, and John came, then not only did they restore the Melchizedek priesthood, but they they restored the sealing power to Joseph yeah. only. Yeah, what Peter, James, and John bring are the keys of the apost or the the apostleship and the keys of the apostleship, but they. Uh, they restore all the, the priesthood authority uh, that Joseph needs as an apostle of Jesus Christ, which is all the authority that we hold today. Now, that doesn't mean uh, we don't have the keys of resurrection, for example, or if we do, they're not enacted. You know, we can't resurrect people uh, from the dead because we don't have those keys. Uh, but we do have the keys of the of sealing authority, which allows us to use the priesthood in that context, but the priesthood already came 
earlier. So Peter, James, and John brought that priesthood authority. Hmm. Okay, and so then when Elijah came in 1836, you're saying he restored the keys of the sealing, which allowed Joseph to, to essentially seal others? Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, they allowed Joseph to direct his authority on behalf of others because the keys provide um, the ability to direct priesthood on behalf of people. Uh, that's, um, but they aren't the priesthood itself. Keys are not equivalent to priesthood. Joseph okay. held the priesthood already. Okay, so I believe Elder Bednar tied this back to baptism for the dead, too. So um, how do you see those tying together with that visit by Elijah? Um, well, Joseph... Joseph can, you know, I don't know. I really don't. To, to be honest, I haven't really given that much thought. Uh, we talk about Elijah and, and sealing parents to children and so right. on. But baptism for the dead is not necessarily a sealing ordinance as much as it is a preliminary ordinance to that. It's a temple ordinance uh, that we perform in, uh, today in, in Salt Lake temples that we're baptized on behalf of other people. But is that authority that Elijah brought, uh, I'm sure other people are more qualified okay. than I am to, to comment on that. We do talk uh, about the spirit of Elijah's genealogy work. And, and I know that's, that's, that's the, the, the way that, that Elder Bednar in his talk uh, spoke um, about that. And we so talk of it in those terms, yes. And that uh, maybe Elijah's keys uh, allowed Joseph then to receive revelation and direct uh, baptisms for the dead. Uh, maybe that is something that Elias or somebody else, uh, Moses brought keys of gathering. Uh, what is gathering if not baptism? You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, so I don't, I don't know. Missionary work, I guess, get to, to direct missionary work. But I, I, I am not. Okay. I'm not a theologian. <laughs> I am a historian, <laughs> and so I can't tell you on that. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, great. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, th these have been some fascinating insights. Um, I just did want to mention one other thing. I, I, um, I spoke with Dr. Bennett about this. There, it seems like there's kind of a Mormon story that, uh, that the early saint, you know, the Kirtland Temple, was the, as the saints built that Kirtland Temple, it, it almost bankrupted them. In fact, I guess it really did bankrupt them. But they talked about uh, tearing up their china and using that in the plaster. and. I think I heard that that wasn't a, that's not a true story. Do you know? Do you know? No, about I'd story? I'd heard that oh, in my life growing up, as many people do, how the saints took their best china and broke it and put it into the plaster, and uh, I couldn't find any accounts where they had done that. Uh, but I did come across a couple of individuals who mentioned as children that they had gone around to the garbage dumps and picked up fragments for for the. Um, Temple plaster, and as I did archaeology out uh, there, I worked under uh, T. Mike Smith, who was our lead archaeologist on that project, and uh, I was digging in the Ashery uh, pit. There was this 30 feet across, probably about 15 feet deep pit of ash, and I went through bushels of ashes and found fragments of ceramics after fragments of ceramics that have been swept up in people's fireplaces and brought there the ash, you know as they brought the ash in all the ceramics and i thought you know why would they take their best china and break it up when they have all this stuff here just thrown out onto the ground as i went back to those children's account account adults accounts of as children uh, going around and gathering up the garbage put in the plaster. I thought, you know, this is how it was done. Uh, they went and got garbage, just like these people are saying they did. They didn't break up their best china, which doesn't make sense. For oh, so there today. is a little bit of truth that I, it wasn't their best china, it was their worst china, or stuff that had already <laughs> it was, been broken. It was the broken stuff. <laughs> they gathered up the garbage. And as I tried to then tra trace out, well, how did that story then get started? I was able to push it clear back to 1910, uh, an individual who was looking at the plaster and saw these fragments of uh, broken plaster and uh, broken china and other things suggested, well, 
you know, they must have taken and broken stuff up to put it in here, and it kind of grew from that to, oh. to the, they broke up their china, and then they broke up their best china, and the, this great sacrifice. They did sacrifice to build that temple. Uh, John Taylor talks about uh, the incredible sacrifice that they made to where it could hardly uh, <laughs> hold, you know, they, even, even the strongest men could hardly bear the burden of trying to build that temple with everything that they had to put in to doing that in their great poverty. Um, it was a fabulous, fabulous building. Uh, polychrome tower, multicolor. We tend to think of it as an all-white structure today because that's how it's ended up over the years. Um, but it was uh, it, it was uh, everything that they could find beautiful. They bought sculpture to put in. They had paintings on the wall. They imported carpet, uh, probably from Great Britain, that they put on the floors, and they imported the best window glass for the windows. And uh, this building was a fabulous structure, but it took incredible sacrifice to do that, including the plaster, even though they got garbage uh, they invented the, the plaster process. The temple plaster uh, was miraculous to the extent that they had to invent a whole new process uh, to make it. And Artemis Millet invented a, a way of taking the lime uh, that they, was the base for the plaster and they would break up uh, materials, largely glass, window, broken window glass fragments and broken uh, fragments of ceramics and things that they would chip into it, put into that to get it to look like granite. They wanted a granite structure, and so the original temple uh, looked like cut granite. They painted the lines so it looked like cut blocks, and then that those little fragments in it made it look like you know polished stone, and it was a new process that they patented. Although Artemis Millet invented the process, Jacob Bump, who was working on the temple as well, he went and got a patent out on it hmm. um, as a process. And so this was a whole, uh, they had to get revelation, if you will, and they had to invent a new, a new way to do that in order to make it look like they had seen it in vision with those cut granite uh, blocks. Okay, so uh, are you... Are, did it kind of like shimmer then in the sunlight with this? I it mean, did. Oh, yeah, wow. the sun would shine on it and you get a little sparkling from a distance and it was quite a dramatic a view from, from the distance. Wow, that must have been pretty pretty cool to see. So let's talk about the Kirtland Bank. Um, Give us all the background on it and why, why we started it and all that. The Kirtland Temple was expensive. Uh, they, they did everything they could to build this fabulous structure that was well beyond their means, but a lot of people donated to it. Uh, they had contributions uh, continuing to come in. Even non-members uh, donated to it because they wanted to contribute to oh, this. Oh, wow. And, I didn't uh, know that non-members contributed. So cool. they had, um, by the time they finished the temple, it was already halfway paid for. Um, now, getting exact figures, because we don't have the ledgers, that were, um, you know, and exactly how much came in, how much went out. Uh, we can only approximate based on uh, things that were said at, or written down at the time or some later reminiscences. But it looks like they were in very good position. They may have owed uh, $20,000 or less on this structure. Um, but they were interested in paying it off. They wanted to get the debt out. Uh, more interested in building Kirtland as a community. They wanted people to come in and while they're paying it off, they're going to continue to expand the community. They have a lot of property that they are then turning around um, to sell to people, dividing it up into smaller segments and selling it. And property all over the region is just going through this phenomenal boom, growth, uh, an economic boom uh, in terms of the prices are skyrocketing People are buying a lot and then selling it for twice the price a few weeks later, and then that person a month or two later is selling it again for twice the price, and uh, the land's just going up uh, quite a bit. There's a lot of speculation throughout the country at this time, and everybody is excited about this great economic boom. Um, 
they could have easily paid off the temple if they had, you know, just waited for a while. Um, and they may have actually been able to, you know, to pay it off almost immediately if they had just drawn on resources. But they're looking to grow the community. And so it's not just a temple debt that they're trying to address as much as it is that they want to expand the community. They want to get in on all this growth that's happening all over the country and everybody's getting excited. Uh, one, they travel to Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, where they go to look for some uh, treasure that's uh, supposedly buried in the basement of a home there, and it turns out that it's really uh, bad information that they have, and that there's not really a treasure buried in this basement, you know, by a ship's captain or somebody that's gone and left it behind. And uh, uh, but while they're going out there, they go through New York, and they visit Wall Street. They see these trains, they see all this industry going on, and they, uh, Oliver Cowdery's writing back these letters and suggesting that banking is something of interest. And uh, exactly how that congeals in their minds, what it is that they plan on doing, um, why, what is it that they see that leads them to this uh, decision, they come back with the idea that they need to have a bank in Kirtland. And um, they need to be able to print their own money and to do, to do their own things, and it will foster this growth. They're getting some revelation along the way, but exactly what they're being told in this revelation, we don't know. Uh, other than that, if they do what the Lord tells them, that everything will be fine. And uh, Joseph Smith uh, shares that with people, Wilfred Woodruff. Uh, uh, writes that down in his journal that is, you know, as long as they do what the Lord tells them to do, that they'll be fine. <laughs> um, which suggests that if they don't, then there could be problems. I'm not sure they really considered the other side of the coin and how important it is that they're that they're obedient to to uh, the revelations that they're receiving. But very early on, they're already receiving some money. From people that's going to go into the bank um, and they're already writing out some IOUs uh, that aren't on printed bank notes but that are kind of making you know promising things as they're trying to do this uh, f f the finances for all this property uh, with the understanding that they're going to have this bank institution <laughs> they uh, Oliver Cowdery gets the the printing plates so they can print bank notes and they begin doing that and Orson Hyde is assigned to go and get the bank charter uh, from the state because the state has to issue that charter so that he'll go to the state legislature that'll, that'll do that. Um, Orson Hyde seems to drag his feet on this whole thing. Why? I don't know if does he think that it's going to be so easy he doesn't need to lay the groundwork or does he think it's so hard that it's kind of it's an impossibility and it's not really even worth his effort and uh, but uh, initially they don't get that bank charter and the their representatives their elected representatives are anti-mormons and they are both connected with the bank of Geauga which is the the largest bank right there in the area so Naturally, they're not going to want to create a competitor to them, and this would be their, their competition. So that would hurt them themselves financially. And, and what politician ever votes on something that's going to hurt him financially? <laughs> a, a few. I'm sure there are some out there, but a few. Um, so they go through somebody else, and it takes some time you know, to get this other person to take uh, the their proposal through and... Uh, uh, and uh, work to get a, a bank charter. Let me ask you a question there. So why do you think these, I mean, besides, I, the competition makes a lot of sense, but why were they anti-Mormon in the first place? Um, well, those questions are always really difficult to answer uh, for any of us. Um, there, are, there are clear economic factors at play. You know, they've been hurt financially and so it can be 
economic interests, and I tend to kind of look at those as being uh, motivators. Um, I suspect that there are other things involved as well, but I can't tell you. Because I know it seems like Joseph Smith was really, that was his big thing, oh, they're anti-Mormons. Um, so I was just wondering, you know, was it like Dr. Hurlburt where his sister joined and he got mad or, you know, whatever? Well, um, yeah, they tended to look at things, you know, as being anti-Mormon or pro-Mormon, and then uh, uh, you could kind of break those down as into... Uh, you know, motivating factors. Uh, I and I tend to to look at the economic factors, which are, are relevant in this case. That there there were economic competitions that uh, there were that uh, motivated these individuals, so that they they had competing in financial interests. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm I'm sure other things have probably played a role as well, but. Um, one of their close associates, Grandis and Newell, he was kind of uh, let out in all of this opposition to the bank. He was on the board of directors of the Geauga Bank with them, um, but he also had business interests in Kirtland uh, that may have been influenced by them and the, the Latter-day Saints in various ways. Um, anyway, while this charter issue is trying to work its way through uh, the legislature, they're already going forward because they have money, they're interest, they've printed it, they're, they're pushing uh, their institution forward. There are lots of institutions all over northeastern Ohio doing exactly the same thing. Uh, they aren't, they aren't uh, unique and they're not even unusual. Uh, it's very typical. What they're doing is just as common as, as can be. Every community is doing exactly the same thing because they're all trying to get in on this. Uh, there are on some of these early um, banknotes, for one day they stamp anti-banking company. Uh, is there some concern that maybe they won't get the charter um, but I think it's more that they're trying, until the charter comes, they're trying to make sure that they follow the law. Um, I don't think that there was ever really much of an interest in calling this the anti-banking company. That's often picked up by historians later on and, and made, um, you know, as a big deal. Uh, but at the time, they don't. I, I find no historical references to it as the anti-banking company other than these banknotes. It's the Kirtland Safety Society or the Kirtland Bank, but the Kirtland Safety Society is what they're calling the organization and it's using similar language. There are other safety societies out there and what it suggests is it's more kind of a working man's bank. It's more a populist kind of an organization and so that suggests that that's their intention is for this to be a working man's uh, organization. So let, let's talk about that word, anti-bank. In the in the Book of Mormon, we talk about the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, and in today's language, we would think they're against the, they're against banks, they're against Nephi and Lehi. But that's not really what the term meant back then. What what, what did the term anti mean back then? Well, in in the context of the Book of Mormon, anti-Nephi-Lehi's, you know, it could be kind of a quasi bank. So it's kind of a bank that's not quite really a bank. It's not opposed to banks as much as it's kind of a a bank that's not yet a chartered institution. And so, uh, did they mean that in this? I don't know. I don't know what they they, did, they leave absolutely no historical record as to why that's attached to those. So, banks. is that what we would say? It's a quasi bank. If, if if Joseph Smith were starting this today, he'd call it a quasi bank, maybe. Um. Yeah, or a credit union. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe they would have called it the Kirtland Credit Union as a uh, as a way of kind of getting around that because it's in some ways, yeah, it was a, it it performed as a bank but was not a bank, and so um, that might have been their intention with that. Uh, they had banking elements. They had a board of directors. Uh, most banks had like three or four individuals that were board of their their board of directors. The Kirtland Safety Society had seven um, who were a f kind of the chairs of the board of directors, but then there were 20, 30 people or more that were actually on the board of directors. This was a massive board 
it was uh, going back again to that working man's kind of uh, organization. Um, it wasn't a communal uh, economic effort in that everybody in the town, at least on the director's level, everybody uh, uh, was part of the directors, but all of the leaders, there were men, there were women, there were members, there were non-members that were on this board of directors. It was a large community effort to participate in this Kirtland Bank. And then they turn around and sell stock into the, to the bank. Uh, most banks in the area, well, most ba in the whole country, uh, banks are selling stock at like $100 a share, which, you know, that's a year's salary for anybody. And you can imagine if you're selling a stock in your enterprise at $30,000 a share, $40,000 a share today, that um, you're not going to get very many investors and that they're going to be very wealthy people. Well, what the Kirtland Safety Society does is they're selling um, stock at very small amounts and you can pay 12 and a half cents and buy um, a, as a, a payment, an initial payment on a share of stock. And so people are, for $25, which is you know, a month's salary there, you, um, you can invest comfortably into this organization. To, and there were lots of uh, people, even poor people, uh, Nathan Staker, one of my ancestors, he's poor. He's a, a former Methodist class leader. Uh, that he's getting help, financial help from his brother-in-law because he can't even support his family. But he buys a, sh a share of stock, uh, you know. And so, uh, this is a, this. Um, I see this as a a different model than what's going on in Missouri, where people are all consecrating all their property and getting back a portion. Uh, this is a different way of getting at that communal organization and uh, building that city of Enoch by allowing everybody to become part of this financial institution that will then help earn money for everybody and help everybody to, um, to kind of lift everybody up together, but also allow everybody to borrow money to b build uh, homes and to buy property and so this is a way of building up the whole community as a whole allowing everybody to benefit and be part of it <coughs> um, and that's how the Kirtland Safety Society starts out very quickly however uh, they run into trouble uh, it's still that chartering is not all uh, resolved itself and it leaves them in legal limbo because a bank needs to have a charter uh, although all these other institutions don't uh, they want to operate as a bank rather than as a you know the local credit union rather than as a kind of an issuing organization that issues promissory notes which are all over the place um, and uh, while that charter is still kind of out in limbo one of those local opponents of theirs, Grandison Newell, he wants to put the bank out of, of commission. And so he goes up and buys up all of the bank notes he can buy. And he comes in and he asks for specie, which is the hard currency, gold and silver coins rather than the paper notes. And the bank has to trade for those. And so all of its currency, it's uh, all of its specie, that's in the coffers of the bank, it's in its vault, uh, they're trading out to Grandison Newell, and he's trying to create a run on the bank. Um, and the way those work is if, uh, the way a run happens is if everybody that has bank notes comes in and wants to take it, yeah, hard currency from the bank, eventually it won't have enough because it has, there are more notes out then there is hard currency and it can't cover for everybody. But as long as everybody has faith in the bank, uh, it'll continue to work properly. The thing about paper money is it always requires faith. If you don't believe in it, it doesn't work. If I don't think that that dollar bill in my wallet is worth anything, it's and nobody else believes it's worth anything, it's not. It's just worth pay it's just paper. It's only when everybody believes that it's worth something that it becomes worth something. 
So, you know, as long as everybody believes the banknotes are worth something, they are. But as Grannis and Newell continue to push forward to um, try to create this run on the bank, well, people began to worry about it. Um, you know, is it going to be successful? Is this going to fail as an institution? Well, one of the families that owned most of the bank stock was the Johnson family. Uh, led by their father, Johnson, John Johnson, Sr. Uh, but he had uh, his sons, Luke and Lyman Johnson, were both apostles. A son-in-law, Orson Hyde, was an apostle. Um, a nephew uh, by marriage, uh, William McClellan, was an apostle. William McClellan? Or another one? Yeah, is, isn't it William McClellan? Yeah, I had to yeah. think. That's okay, right. he's one of the first. To, okay, yeah. So William McClellan, um, Orson Hyde, John jo uh, Lyman Johnson, Luke Johnson are all uh, either sons, sons-in-law, or a nephew by marriage of John Johnson Sr. So he's very much tied into this community. Has a lot of influence. He's been given responsibility for the property to sell all that property that's in Kirtland. He had sold his own farm and apparently consecrated all that property, the, the finances from that from his sale to the church. And in exchange, he received the responsibility to sell the property in Kirtland from the Peter French farm. Now, probably, but it's not clear in the record, probably his money from his sale had gone to help buy that Peter French farm. But however his money had gone, it might have gone to help with Kirtland Camp, it might have gone to help with, with other things. Uh, he had responsibility for the Peter French farm and to sell that property. He, John Johnson Sr., loses faith in this whole Kirtland Safety Society enterprise. Why? Don't know. Uh, was there a specific incident? Did Joseph Smith insult him? Did he um, see something that he didn't trust in terms of a financial document? Did, he, you know, whatever. Whatever uh, the, it was, John Johnson Sr. panics and he goes out and begins to immediately sell this property at um, giveaway prices. He's given it to his sons, son-in-law, family members, also some of his friends and associates and others. He's getting rid of this property because um, he wants to be able to get what he can out of it all. That property would have supported the bank. If the bank had collapsed, the property would have been there in place to, to, as, as one of the resources for the bank. If, Grandis and Newell had gotten all the specie out. They could have sold that property and then continued to give him um, coin. But because John Johnson's out divesting himself of all his property, the, one of the major sources of collateral for the bank is also disappearing, along with the other one, which is the gold and silver <laughs> coin. Because of that, the whole foundation on which the Kirtland Bank is built begins to crumble. Uh, there isn't any more support behind those banknotes, and as long as there's uh, and as that support dissolves, faith in the banknotes also begins to dissolve, and people began to all rush in, just as Grannis and Newell had hoped, and began to demand payment on the banknotes. And as they do that, the value of the notes drops to where they become virtually worthless. <laughs> uh, nobody will accept them in trade. Uh, you can't buy anything with them. And you're, you're left with very little uh, to accomplish anything with. <coughs> so, um, by, this all happens over a couple of months, period of time, by June 9th of 1837, Joseph Smith realizes that the bank just can't continue to survive. By that time, John Johnson's pulled out. Uh, they're struggling. It's still 
operating as an institution, but Joseph Smith publishes in the paper that he no longer supports the institution. He withdraws from it. Um, some of his associates still think that they can make it all work, and they continue on. Uh, the principal one being a Warren Parish, who had been one of Joseph's scribes. He's also worked as the um, in the bank, uh, signing Joseph's notes for him and trying to, uh, managing day-to-day -day operations as the teller. He, and as the bank teller, back then you were responsible for all of uh, the ins and outs of the money com coming into the institution. And so uh, Warren Parrish continues the institution um, and what he does apparently is he takes banknotes that have been redeemed and he then begins to take those out and circulate them again uh, even though people have come and gotten their their money for those notes and Brigham Young is one of those who says that he's redeemed his note and he finds it out again in circulation um, and it's not Banknotes back then weren't like uh, dollar bills today where you take a dollar and it's worth the same for everybody. It's like a promissory note, an IOU, and so once it's redeemed, it's redeemed and cancelled. Uh, you know, more <laughs> notes are issued, and so if those notes are going out again, um, once they've been redeemed, that's as though they've never been redeemed, and you keep holding that debt plus new debt um, that's out. And uh, so uh, these notes are all c are going out into circulation uh, into the community to where it's building more and more debt because more it has to the bank has to now pay for more and more notes uh, that are out there and, and eventually it collapses as an institution and everybody that's, that's holding those bank notes <laughs> is holding worthless paper. So let me make sure I understand. That. <clears throat> so you said Brigham Young. He got a bank note saying he owed money to the bank uh, for $100, whatever it was. And then he paid off that $100, let's say, and then they didn't cancel the note, they just reissued it to someone else? Is that what you said? Yeah, when you, when you go get a loan from, when, uh, from that bank, you know, at that time period, you get a loan and you'd say to the Kirtland Safety Society, I want to borrow $200 so I can buy this land, plant my crops, and I will pay back, you know, $100 this year and $100 next year plus 8% interest. So I'll, you know, pay you back $216 at the end of, you know, half of it this year and half next year. And in exchange, you give them then the bank notes and they've got to pay you back from those notes, from other notes, from hard currency, over those two-year periods, they've got to pay back for those bank notes. Those bank notes then are exchangeable that you can pass them out the, the to The farmer has to pay back. The, the farmer has to pay back to the bank what he's borrowed, that right. $216. And so he gets a bank note in return. <laughs> he gets two, yeah, $200 in bank notes now that he can go out and buy his seed, buy his land, make, or make his land payment if he can't buy all the land, but he can then buy seed and hire some workers to help him to earn enough money to then meet his uh, payments. And so that bank note then represents a loan from the bank that he's got to pay back. Um, and if somebody like Brigham Young then gets that note and they go put it into the bank because they're investing in the bank or they, you know, they, he, Brigham Young paints the house of the farmer and so the farmer gives him $25 out of that loan that he got. Brigham Young takes that Kirtland note and he takes it back to the bank, deposits it in and says, you know, this is my $25 for my account. Then the bank has that money in that's been redeemed. That note now is gone, but the bank owes Brigham Young $25 of specie eventually or could give him another bank note or whatever, but that note's been redeemed. So that original farmer has used that in some transactions and it um, then uh, ends up back in the bank, which would then it would be crossed out. But the debts that the farmer owes and the debt that the safety society owes to Brigham Young are both still on the books. 
that need to be resolved with some kind of a bank note. So over time, it could be a Geauga County bank note that they pay with. It could be hard currency that the federal government's publishing, printing. The government's not printing any paper money at this time. They're just doing the hard currency. Um, or it could be more safety society notes to kind of keep that loan floating, which they could do as well so that they don't have to kind of redeem it all over time. Um, but as it all collapses, all you know, and everybody wants their money in, and the people who got the debts aren't going to go back and pay, um, then it all falls apart. Okay. All right. So that makes sense. It's, it, you, you described the economics very well there. So, it's, uh, so what, let me ask you this question. Grandison Newell, wasn't he, or maybe there's somebody with a similar name that published the Book of Mormon? Or is that just somebody with a similar name? Published the Book of Mormon. Yeah, there's a... Oh, Egbert like a, Grandin. Egbert Grandin. Oh, so it's, some, it's a different it's a name, different, but a very similar diff, name. Yeah, okay. similar. Grandison was his, the first name of Mr. Newell. Oh, okay. And Grandin was the last name of I was of wondering Egbert. if those were related, but they were not, not. They were not related or connected at all. Okay. So, um, so it d sounds like Grandison Newell and John Johnson... Uh, didn't really take the blame on on the bank failure. It was it was Joseph Smith. Is that right? Well, G Joseph Smith, um, as the banks, uh, as he withdraws from the bank back in June ninth of eighteen thirty seven, as he says, I'm have no, you know, I'm not going to be involved in this anymore. Uh, whether of guilt or compassion for everybody else or whatever, he begins to take on the debts of all these individuals who've been using money under his, uh, under the people who have gotten loans to operate businesses and probably primarily the church. Um, he's calling in all those debts and trying to settle the books. And so if you look at Newell K. Whitney's day book from that time period, it becomes a bank ledger in of itself. People own Whitney money, and Joseph Smith is taking on their debts. And there are quite a few individuals. Um, there is, for example, piping for a steam engine pipe for the sawmill that the church is using, that they'd use to build the temple. Joseph Smith takes on the debts for all that sawmill construction. And I, and I believe that the church still owns that sawmill. <laughs> so it's a church debt, but that whoever had taken that on, Joseph Smith is now taking that on himself. And he's gathering all these other debts as well so that he becomes responsible for that. I think that principally his interest is in settling those debts, making sure that it all gets settled. And he has uh, specific individuals who are assigned to make sure that they set, make sure all those payments are made and that everybody is uh, paid off in this process. But it also puts him up to be the fall guy, you know, when all the debt, kind of, when everything collapses, he's the one that's owing all of this. And so I don't know if he wants to protect everybody from all the, the subsequent lawsuits. Uh, there may be, and uh, probably is that as a, a motivating factor, but I think that it's also uh, to make it easier for him to settle all of these debts uh, that are incurred for church activities and for other things that they've been doing. Um, as part of this uh, process. Um, and uh, while he's doing that, Grandison Newell is working out um, legal action against Joseph Smith for operating this institution without a charter because banks needed a charter. Even though all these other organizations are operating without them, um, if you were to be a bank, you had to have, have a charter. And there, were, there was public sympathy for these institutions. Somebody else tried to do a similar thing and charge uh, a community that ha had a, a banknote operation. Uh, they were trying to try them for not operating without a bank charter. And the jury uh, didn't even leave the jury box to deliver a, a non-guilty verdict. They just... They listened to all the evidence and they said he's not guilty because they considered that even though he'd done that, that that was just kind of normal practice. That's what everybody needed to do 
to make finances work because the federal government wasn't issuing paper money. Uh, it was all private institutions that were doing that <laughs> at that time. Now, did that exonerate Joseph uh, for operating the institution without a bank charter? Uh, well, no, because he ended up being uh, tried for it and convicted uh, for that. But did Joseph have honorable intentions through the whole thing? Absolutely. And he tried and made every effort to, um, to pay off all the debts that were incurred in this process. And even the very last night of his life, while he's laying on the floor of Carthage jail, he's still dreaming about those Kirtland troubles. And he'd been weeks before that sending uh, letters out to people and warning people to not take Kirtland banknotes. They weren't good anymore. and to, uh, it, it haunted him for a, a long time afterward. Uh, but he was tried. And he was convicted. Grandison Newell is the one that led the whole thing. And as the one promoting it, he got paid half of the, the fine. So he got paid $500, and the other 500 was supposed to go to the government. <laughs> um, the, the judge that, that listed all this and the prosecuting attorney were both Grandison Neal's business partners, and so it was hard for them to co come up with any other decision than one in favor of Grandison Neal, but they... Um, uh, Newell uh, later double dipped and he got paid the other half as well. So he ended up getting um, more twice as much money as he was legally owed uh, for for this whole affair. So he came out uh, doing very well in the whole thing. So he made a lot of money. What was Joseph convicted of then? He was convicted of operating a bank without a charter. Oh, okay. Um, was it justified? I don't think so. I think you can make a case uh, that the conviction was not um, was not legally valid, but I'm not an attorney, and I'm not really in a position to judge that well, and so I'm hoping that the attorneys will all get together and look at that carefully and decide among them, you know, whether, whether he deserved the conviction or not, but uh, it it happened. I'll have to ask Richard Turley. Isn't he an attorney? He yeah. is. Maybe he can tell you. <laughs> I want to talk to him too. So, All right. Well, I really appreciate you uh, taking your time to, to talk with us about this. I think this has been a fascinating discussion, and, and uh, <clears throat> I know I need to let you go. So, uh, Once again, thank you um, for, for being here on Gospel Tangents, and uh, we'll, we'll talk to you later. You're welcome. Have Thanks. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Mark Staker. Mark, thank you so much for sitting down with me, and I'm glad that I could clean up all those audio problems. If you go back to the other ones, you'll notice that it's only in one ear. And Anyway, I'm glad that I'm smarter than I was clear back in 2017, and I was able to clean up a lot of that audio. So thanks again, Mark. I really appreciate it. If you like what we're doing here on Gospel Tangents, please become a paid subscriber at gospeltangents.com or patreon.com slash gospeltangents. We've got full transcripts on our website at gospeltangents.com. And if you'd like to check out some of our other conversations, click over here. Thanks. <laughs>